According to the rabbinic tradition, when Moses ascended the mountain and appeared before God in heaven, he encountered God sitting with quill in hand before a scroll of the Torah. Bewildered that the Holy One would be adding to the Torah already revealed at Sinai, Moses drew nearer to discover God decorating each of the letters with crowns. Mustering his courage, the humble prophet asked, Master of the universe, is there anything lacking in Torah that additions are required? To which God responded, In future generations, there will arise the sagest of rabbis, Akiva ben Yosef, He will study every jot of ink, every letter of the law, to reveal its secrets. Moses inquired, Holy One of blessing, might I see this man? Look, and indeed you shall, God replied. Moses lifted his eyes and beheld before him the classroom of Rabbi Akiva and eight rows of scholars. Intently they listened, absorbing every word Akiva spoke. Moses took a seat in the back of the hall and attempted to follow Akiva's teachings. But what he heard was utterly foreign to him, and he grew concerned. Then one of the students asked Akiva, From where do you know this law? To which Akiva replied, This is the Torah received by Moses at Sinai. Hearing this, Moses was reassured, for now he knew that Akiva had only built upon the solid foundation of Torah itself. I begin with the tale of Moses in Akiva's classroom because in this week's parasha, Pinchas, God invites Moses to view the land that God will soon give to the Israelite people as their inheritance, a land Moses is forbidden to enter. As Moses approaches the moment of his death, Adonai says to him, Ascend these heights of Abarim and view the land that I have given to the Israelite people. When you have seen it, you too shall be gathered to your kin, just as your brother Aaron was. For in the wilderness of Zin, When the community was contentious, you disobeyed my command to uphold my sanctity in their sight by means of the water. The reference recalls the incident in Numbers when Moses struck a rock to bring forth water and satisfy the people's thirst rather than speak to the rock as God had commanded him and produce the water in God's name. We have discussed in years past the age-old question of whether Moses' punishment fit his crime. Given all that he had accomplished for the Israelites and for God, should this act of frustration at the Israelites' incessant whining have prevented him from reaping the reward of his 40 years of service? The rabbis sense the injustice. And so imagine that Moses was afforded the unique privilege of viewing the land, not just as it lay before him, but also the future it would hold. And they offer this legend of Moses gazing from the mountaintop into the classroom of Rabbi Akiva and finding comfort in the knowledge that the Torah Moses once transcribed for Israel has not only remained their source of moral guidance, but become a basis for even greater instruction. As we gather on this Shabbat following Independence Day and weigh the challenges America faces and the potential for leadership America holds, one might wonder how our nation's founders would have considered the imperatives of the early 21st century and our government's response to them. Would they have been as bewildered by what they beheld as Moses was? Would Jefferson have deemed the principles of liberty and equality articulated in his Declaration of Independence appropriately honored today? 
How would Madison have judged the array of legal decisions drawn from his Bill of Rights? Our founders' nuanced, timeless essays on topics of social concern penned more than two centuries ago offer some clues. How, for example, might they have responded to today's immigration crisis? We know they did not consider security and compassion as mutually exclusive. Alexander Hamilton noted, there is a wide difference between closing the door altogether and throwing it entirely open. While Jefferson admitted the possibility of a population growth through immigration too rapid for the best interests of the receiving nation, he also recognized, quote, a right which nature has given to all men of departing from the country in which chance, not choice, has placed them, of going in quest of new habitations. Shall we refuse the unhappy fugitives from distress, he asked, that hospitality extended to our fathers arriving on this land? Shall oppressed humanity find no asylum on this globe? And how would the Constitution's framers have viewed the Supreme Court's 2008 District of Columbia v. Heller ruling on the Second Amendment, divorcing considerations of private gun ownership from the maintenance of a militia? While Madison and Hamilton supported the individual's right to keep and bear arms, they could not have imagined the mass shootings to which we have grown accustomed. And as they explained in the Federalist Papers, their well-regulated militia was a necessary means of maintaining national security in the absence of the standing army they opposed, but we possess. And even in the Heller decision, Justice Scalia noted, nothing in our opinion should be taken to cast doubt on laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms. Like most rights, he explained, the right secured by the Second Amendment is not unlimited. It is not a right to keep and carry any weapon whatsoever, in any manner whatsoever, and for whatever purpose. Since 2008, the year of the Supreme Court's ruling, there have been more than 600 mass shootings in America. So societal context changes often radically, and law must keep pace. The Bible's prescriptions for justice are certainly insufficient to today's greater understandings of gender identity, sexual preference, and emotional health, and for today's medical know-how. I, and I hope must, most of us, believe the legalization of abortion on the one hand and same-sex marriage on the other represent hard-fought progress. Deuteronomy's command, justice, justice shalt thou pursue, recognize that our standards of justice cannot remain fixed. Rather, they must advance to answer the exigencies of the moment. It is impossible to know fully how the founders would have viewed the nature of American life and law today. But if we value such ideals as they bequeathed us, which Independence Day celebrates, we must ensure those principles continue to flourish by electing leaders who understand them as we do and who will appoint judges who understand them as we do. The choice is ours what the future holds. The story of Moses and Akiva ends with a heart-rending coda. Perhaps believing himself righteous like Akiva, and therefore do honor like Akiva, Moses demands of God, show me Akiva's reward. Behold, God responds, and you will see. Moses turns to witness Akiva being tortured to death by the Romans. Painfully, Moses learns that the reward of the righteous is not always the attainment of their goals in their lifetime. I've seen the promised land, Dr. King told that Memphis crowd hours before his own death. 
I may not get there with you, but I want you to know that we, as a people, will get to the promised land. We learn. Each generation must lift its voice, sometimes putting its safety and comfort on the line for the sake of the generations to come. When the time arrives for us to ascend the heights of Abarim, may we be able to look out with confidence and see beyond the years a future for America of security, but also one of liberty and compassion. And may we know, as Moses knew on the day of his death, that we have done our part to make it so. Amen.